Earlier this year, the federal government announced Canada's Feminist International Assistance Policy. It aims to ensure that at least 95% of Canada's foreign aid helps improve the lives of women and girls. It is part of an approach that sees a critical role for women in building peace and prosperity in conflict and post-conflict zones. And we're pleased that it brings four people deeply involved in these issues to our studio tonight. So let's welcome Agnes Wasuk Petya. She is a coordinator of the South Sudan Council of Churches, the National Women's Program, as well as that organization's youth coordinator, that is Awak Hussein Deng. They are both visiting us in Canada from South Sudan. Rachel Warden is here. She is program coordinator for the Gender, Justice and Women of Courage programs at the faith-based Canadian non-governmental organization Kairos. And Sadia Hamdani is here. She is director, gender equality and child protection from Plan Canada. And as you can all tell, one of you is going to have to host this show pretty soon because my voice is about to give out. But we'll do the best we can. Uh, Rachel, get us started. What does Kairos do? Well, Kairos is an ecumenical organization that brings together 10 church churches and church organizations in their work for human rights and social justice. And we have a focus on, on gender justice. So we work with partners both internationally and in Canada. And we have a long history of working with women's organizations and women's movements on issues of, of women, peace and security. Um, and we've, we've learned a lot from our partners and uh, we've built, uh, together with partners, a Women of Courage program. So that's one of our key programs within Kairos. Tell us about the tour that you have coordinated for Kairos. Okay, the tour coincides with 16 days to, to end gender-based violence, which, which spreads from November 20, 25th, the International Day to End Gender-Based Violence, and December 10th, which is International Human Rights Day. And we have been touring with uh, Agnes and Awak from the South Sudan Council of Churches uh, to uh, seven cities, four provinces, uh, in Canada, trying to raise awareness and, and visibilize the situation of um, uh, women in, in South Sudan, um, the, the egregious situation of human rights in South Sudan, um, but also to really highlight the, the role that, um, that women and youth are playing in, in building peace and, and, addressing, addressing hum and addressing human rights and, and building inclusive communities. Let's find out more about South Sudan. Agnes, it is it has got to be one of the saddest places in the world right now with all of the terrible violence going on. Tell us about your connection to that violence. Uh, I am one of those who was born in war, grew up in war, become a grandmom in war. That violence means lack of peace to me personally and lack of peace to all South Sudanese. That violence means to me uh, destruction, uh, lack of development, uh, absence of, uh, absence of uh, services to the people means to me a lot. And it, it made me feel pain really on how long are we going to be in, in war and the generations that are coming up, what will they learn from us? And that is what made me to commit myself to work for peace. Let me follow up with a walk. There was such hope when South Sudan was created as its own country, uh, not that long ago, but it has descended into violence and misery for so many since then. What's your connection to it? Um, as a U.S. person, like, uh, find yourself living through all this uh, conflict and um, not even talking about that the U.S. are actually the firewood, you know, because they are the one who fight and they are the one who, you know, when the fight finished, they are the one who find themselves uh, unemployed, you know, sitting around, sometimes just hang out. So it's, um, it's actually touching and, 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 and it's, um, like, have a real, real big, effect and real bad effect on uh, on on use because um they like they just they're the one who pay every uh, pay the the higher price you know let me yeah, let me understand that more young people pay a different price than older people in yes. these fights how so okay um the older people they are actually already going through the conflict and they they living it but when you come to the to the young nation which is supposed to be like the future like they are tomorrow for the for the country but you find them doing nothing like absolutely nothing because they just Either they go to war, got killed, or come back injured, or after the war finish, you you find them like the 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 one who doesn't have anything to do, you know, and all those kind of things. Uh, so they are paying actually twice more than the the elders because they are the one who send them. You go, you go, and they are sitting here. So they are actually, like I said, they are the firewood for for the for the war. The firewood yeah. that is quite the metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> Sadia, I want to bring you in at this point. Tell us about what Plain Canada is doing in this conflict. 
Um, not particularly in this conflict, uh, Steve, but uh, Plan, Ca Plan International commits to realizing the rights of women and girls across all our programming, and we do work in South Sudan also. Um, in that, our role is throughout our programming to carry out what we call gender transformative programming, which takes a very, very targeted approach to uh, empowering women and girls across all kinds of programs, such as young people like Awak herself and uh, Agnes here, you know, uh, making sure that throughout any kind of programming that we do, whether it's development assistance or working in humanitarian con in context, um, we work together with organic grassroots organizations and movements and youth movements um, to, to take the agenda forward. So that is how, what we do. Uh, through our work. And why do you think it's important to focus on women and girls as opposed to uh, everybody? Ah, uh, well, if you look at absolutely any um, data out there, right, any kind of indicator, um, be it in health, in education, in, in economic participation, you will find that women and girls are heavily disadvantaged relative to men and boys. And unless, and this is all basically because of prevailing gender inequality and discrimination against women and girls just because they are female. Um, so it is clear to us, and, and I, I, Rachel would absolutely agree with me, to everyone working in development cooperation, that unless these root causes of inequality are addressed head on, absolutely no goal will be met in the world, whether it's through the sustainable development goals, Nothing will matter. Optimal kind of outcomes for everybody, men and women alike, will not be possible. So it is critical to recognize a couple of things. One is that women and girls actually contribute heavily to their societies, even in conflict situations. Look at, look at who we have today, right? So their contributions are totally invisible. It is critical to visibilize those contributions and bring them at the heart of development cooperation. Let me follow up uh, over here with Rachel on this one. I think it's, I think I'm on pretty safe ground in saying that most of the wars in our world are started by men. Men make the decision to go to war, men mm -hmm. fight the wars, men are killed in wars. I, mean, I want to know about women and I want to know about uh, how actively women are allowed to be involved in, for example, peace negotiations to end those wars. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's the problem, because when we're talking about peace negotiations, it's usually the armed actors who are involved in those peace uh, negotiations, and those at a high level tend to be, tend to be the men. There have been studies that show that, that peace processes that involve women last longer uh, and are and more inclusive and are more just, not just for women, but for, for everybody. So why aren't uh, more women involved? Well, I think uh, because of uh, tr traditionally they've been been excluded, um, and it's they and it's it's a real struggle. But they have been. Uh, it is being recognized now. Uh, well, within the UN, there's the UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which um, uh, says women should be involved in 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 peace building from a community level to a national to an international level. Um, and uh, I think now with the, you know, the feminist international assistance policy uh, in Canada, it's being recognized that women do play a key role in, in, in building peace. And, and it's women, it's, it's nonpartisan women, and it's grassroots women that p play that role. Because the, those are the women who, those are the people and the women who have been involved in peace for uh, and peace movements for a very long time, and they have something to say. So, I mean, in all of our work in, in Kairos, in South Sudan, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in Colombia, in the Philippines, where we work on these issues, we've seen that, that women, uh, yes, they're, they're uh, impacted by the war, and they're, uh, they're, uh, they feel the, uh, the f impacts and the violations of war much more acutely often than, than men, but they also play a really key role in, in, building, in building peace, and, in which case, and they need to be heard. Let me go to Agnes and find out whether or not you believe that women are as actively involved in the efforts to bring peace in South Sudan through negotiations as they could be or should be. No, they are not really, but uh, maybe only those who are uh, part of maybe in their parties or in, in, in the political uh, arena, but mm. uh, not all the women. And this is what we are fighting on. We need at least uh, the inclusivity of women from all levels. 
Awak, I wonder about that. Uh, how, how do we get more women involved in the actual peace process, in the actual negotiations? Is that uh, possible to do? Yeah, it's actually, it's quite possible uh, to do. But you need to convince, um, you know, those uh, party who we who will go and sit on the table, because like um, Magnus said, er, uh, I mean uh, Rachel said earlier, the one that. Uh, Go, uh, do the war there, the one who come and sit down again, saying that we want to talk about peace. You are the one who started, and how come you're going to talk about peace uh, only you? So they need to be convinced that uh, you need to put some uh, more women inside there. Otherwise, this peace, uh, peace negotiation may not sustain for a long time. How do you convince them to do that? Uh, as a youth person, well, I, I can convince the uh, young men, which I have already did part of it, you know, like... Uh, let, telling them that we are not less than men, we are actually sometimes same as them or maybe even more. Uh, let them know that uh, women are, yes, vulnerable, but at the same time, they, are, they have power. They can, they can make change. So uh, it, this is one of uh, the seminars that we are actually conducting, and most of the, po the people that are supporting are men. So they're already adopting the idea of uh, women are not less than us, but the, uh, this idea needs to be, you know, uh, reach to a higher level. If that idea reach up to the higher level, I guess women can be um, part of the peace negotiation and we will have a good peace agreement. I don't know this for sure, but I want to ask your opinion about this. I suspect that men are afraid that because women tend to be more consensus oriented, mm -hmm. they're afraid you're going to give the store away and not be good negotiators, not be tough enough at the negotiating table. Is that legitimate? Steve, it all goes back to what is the n norm, the, the value women are held in. It's, it's underlying everything, right? Most of the time in the work we do in, in the field, we hear things like, well, women don't have the same um, exposure as we men do. Therefore, their ideas are very, very, if you like, provincial and insular and not the same breadth of knowledge. Whereas all that might be true, there's a historical reason for it. Perhaps the education level might not be the same, or their exposure may not be the same. However, it is true what you say, that there is this whole idea of power, which you just mentioned, and I totally agree with you. The power, the dynamic, the shift of power is something that probably men are very afraid of. And in our programming, we've learned that, you know, where you talk about power sharing between men and women, it isn't that scary at the end of the day. Um, it's a matter of moving together, moving forward together. And we find that it is very, very difficult to sensitize men. And I, I salute you when you say that you're starting with young men. That's obviously probably the best way to start. You know, it's, it's the lower hanging Cause, fruit. Because the older guys are, are too set in their ways already. <laughs> No, we have a lot of experience, positive experience, of very, very older men with entrenched notions taking a very strong stand on these issues. I think it is a matter of recognizing women's contributions that already exist, the power and the inherent agency women have. Talking about peace building, conflict prevention, conflict resolution, peacekeeping and building. Women have the knowledge and expertise of their communities. And to leverage that and to, to build on that is so critical. I appreciate that. But, but in my experience, men don't let you come in through the door unless you bang it down. So well, what, are you, I, what are you doing about I, that? I, well, I think yeah. we have a, actually a really positive example in, in Colombia, in the peace process in yeah. Colombia. And that uh, Kairos also uh, works with grassroots women's organizations in, in Colombia. So when the negotiations uh, for the, uh, the peace accord in Colombia started in 2012, uh, women weren't at the table. Um, but um, because, as I was talking about, you know, women's role in, in defending human rights and in peace building throughout the decades of war in Colombia, they were clamoring and they were demanding a place at the table. And, and they did get a place at the negotiating table. How did that uh, happen? And, 
um, through um, through de through their demands, through their uh, they 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 traveled to 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 Havana. They they demanded a place at the table because of their their um, connection with uh, with the with the communities and uh, their 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 experience in, in peace us, building. Did they get out on the streets, racial and bang pots and pans? Or <laughs> what, what what made it happen? Well, I um, I think it was that they were they're they're so well organized. There's a strong strong women's movement in in Colombia. I mean, the the partner that we work with. In, in Colombia has 45 years of experience mm. working in a, in a war that was, uh, you know, six decades long. Uh, so they are creative, they're tenacious, uh, and they, they, um, they got their voices heard. And so the, the resulting peace accord, although it's not perfect, includes women and includes a gender component, and women are involved in the implementation of that peace process. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's that's perhaps a, this, you know, a positive the, uh, example. Just a little background for everybody. This was between the government of Colombia and the FARC, I guess, that's which right, was the yeah. acronym of the yes, so-called right. terrorist group at the time. That, that's right. Do you think so, if women had not been involved that they would have eventually been able to resolve this, which they clearly hadn't been able to do for six decades? Well, I think, um, I, I think that there's, there's proof that uh, peace processes that involve women and involve uh, civil society. So in general, in these peace processes, not only women are excluded, but, but civil society, youth are excluded, indigenous people, uh, Afro-Colombians were excluded. But by including those, uh, those groups in peace processes, you, of course you're going to get a peace process that's more durable, more sustainable, more inclusive, and just for everybody. I, Agnes, want to ask you, I'm going to guess that 99.9% .9 of the people watching us right now have never been to South Sudan, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it, it, first of all, it's a very new country. And second of all, it's just in a part of the world where there is not a lot of travel by Canadians or others from the West, for that matter. What do you think we need to know about what it's like to be a woman in South Sudan today? Yeah, in South Sudan, uh you need to know that uh, women in South Sudan are clearly suffering. They are faced with a lot of violations. And it's because of the wars, the recurring wars. Uh, we, we went a long uh, a journey in war, starting from 1955 up to today. We partly get peace, but then again, we, we go back to, to war. You said violations. What kinds of violations? There are a lot of uh, violations, just like um, uh, sexual violations. You know, in war, always women are used as tools for people to reach their interests. Uh, there are a lot of sexual violations. Those women who are violated have no place to go and uh, share their, their issues, their pains. These are some of the issues that women in South Sudan go through. At the same time, uh, currently there are a lot of problems, um, economic crisis, hunger, you know. These uh, challenges are all facing women in South Sudan. So they face uh, double uh, challenges, like they're in war, and at the same time, they're looking for, for, for survival for themselves and their children. I want to ask Sadia about Canada's attempt to step into this story and make some progress. I think it was about six months ago that the federal government announced Canada would have a feminist international assistance policy. What's that done so far? Well, first of all, I think we all welcome that policy. Um, Canada has been a leader on promoting gender equality for some decades now, and this is, of course, a huge affirmation of that. In terms of impact, Steve, it's been six months, right? <laughs> it's yeah. a bit early too in the soon. day. Too, too soon to tell. Yeah. However, um, Real effects will be visible, uh, and and you know once the um, commitment to have a standalone outcome for the promotion of women's rights and women's empowerment in and of itself, along with any other one of the sector programs, will definitely uh, have a lot of impact. But the real one is that many of the organizations who have been working with the, the government of Canada for decades will be forced also into taking a feminist approach, or, or they have been, but it'll be more concerted and targeted across programming, particularly also within uh, humanitarian programming. So that will be a huge step forward, and we look forward to it. But there's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> Rachel, what's your view? Yeah. 
Yeah, of course, we, um, we welcomed it and, and partners as well. These, these are issues, as I said, that we've been working on for a very long time with partners. And we were involved in sort of lobbying uh, around the international assistance program. So we were very, very happy to see this reflected in the actual policy. Um, and so we, we celebrated that. Um, but now is the question, yet as, as Adi was saying, of implementation and also um, putting money into the, into the policy. Um, so right now, um, Canada um, put, has uh, the international standard for uh, international uh, assistance, uh, the international assistance envelope is 0.7% is of the gross national income. And, and right now, Canada's contribution is 0.26%, uh, which is pretty, pretty shameful, and it's been decreasing. So um, we, we think that the Canada needs to put more money into, into this policy. Um, but they also, it also needs to be directed at grassroots women's organizations like the South Sudan Council of Churches, um, like the, the partners that are working on the ground in, grass, uh, in grassroots and really know, uh, know the situation and can, can build peace uh, from the ground up. So it's not only a question of money, it's a question of how that money is spent and, and who, it's, who, it, who it's spent on. And, and the idea of working with women's organizations and, and, and women's movements. And I think also de de um, adopting a human rights approach where um, w the women who are, who are defending peace and, and human rights are protected and accompanied, and, and that the, the Canadian government is, is, uh, is committed to that as well. So, so we are excited, um, but uh, we, we also realize that there's a lot of work ahead in, in holding the government accountable for this. Sadia, uh, we pointed out already earlier in the program, South Sudan's a long way away. There are yeah. a lot of Canadians who've never heard of it, certainly never been there. They probably are wondering whether we, spending as little as Rachel just suggested we are, can really have any impact over there at all. Do you think we can? Absolutely. Um, first of all, um, Canadians, if you speak, if you're talking about, we have evidence, and Rachel, of course, would also agree, evidence that Canadians are a very generous people. Um, I think by, by raising their voices and by standing up to such uh, situations that we see every day because, Steve, conflict has no boundaries, right? Everyone is affected by them. With a history like Canada of, of lasting peace and human rights, I mean, standing up for these issues by every Canadian is critical and that has a massive impact. The very fact that the government has actually uh, adopted a policy such as the Feminist International Assistance Policy is testimony to the fact that Canadians care. And certainly, this will not happen tomorrow or, or the day after tomorrow, but I believe that raising their voices and raising uh, these issues everywhere is critical and will have an impact for sure. Awak, I just want to ask you, how long have you been in Canada now? Um, almost uh, more than 16 days. 16 days. Yeah. What do you think of what you see? Um, it has been actually a learning journey because I have been seeing a lot, uh, knowing a lot, hearing a lot. So I, 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 I liked it, you know, the, the idea that um, from, from where I came from, um, I never thought that Canada have actual issues or problems. But when I came here, I get to know that uh, they, they are facing a lot of problems like violence and like those of uh, indigenous people who have been going you know, through a lot of things. So um, I, I, it was a real learning journey for me. So I, I liked it. And um, the good thing about it, like people in Canada, they talk about their problems. They talk about their issues. You know, they don't just keep them inside. Mm. We have the same problem, but we don't talk about them. You know, we don't say them out loud. Like maybe that's why people are so sometimes so much violence because there is a lot of anger inside them mm -hmm. because they don't speak out. Yeah. So this is one of the things I, um, I like about Canada and I, I hope I will be you know it's uh, one of the learning things. Agnes let me finish up on you what's your view? In Canada I've uh, learned a lot as uh, our work puts it. Uh, it was like we were here to share our issues as South Sudanese women and maybe to let our problem be known but uh, I came to, to realize that also in Canada we have learned a lot especially when we visited some uh, places of the indigenous people. Uh, I remember we visited a hospital in Rajaina, and in that hospital we shared with the 
one indigenous man who is responsible for the spiritual uh, items of the indigenous people. And he shared with us, not only sharing, but he has given us uh, an input or maybe uh, a backup to what we had been looking for. Like, uh, as I mentioned, uh, South Sudanese are traumatized. The word South Sudan means trauma to the people of South Sudan. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas that we, the women in the Council of Churches, are trying to focus on is the trauma healing. Mm -hmm. In that hospital, I learned about some of the mechanism for, for trauma healing. And he shared with us how to forgive, how to get connected with the self and with the creator, and how to understand issues. So it, it is about uh, really not only our, our problems, but also we, we come to know that in Canada, there are a lot of issues that are related to, to our, our issues. We have uh, attended the blanket exercise of Kairos Canada, and there were some papers read. And in those papers, the, the issues that were uh, aired out are the same issues that we are living in the South Sudanese. Mm. So I was like, oh, we are not alone. <laughs> there are also some uh, problems here. And also the warm welcoming of the Canadians, starting by the Kairos Canada staff and the partners of Kairos. Wherever we go, we find a warm welcoming. And it is like, oh, uh, we are not uh, disconnected. Even though South Sudan is not known to Canada, but uh, the people here uh, knew that there's somewhere uh, in the world a place called South Sudan. And these are the people of South Sudan. Well, I'm happy to say that uh, I'm glad that you two have learned something from your trip here to Canada, because we have surely learned something from your visit to our program tonight. So I want to thank all four of you for coming into TVO tonight and sharing your views on this important subject. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.